you needed to play a little bit longer. <laughs> Welcome to worship this evening. It's good to be here. It's good to, uh, to lead worship. I have no announcements to make. And so uh, we will begin with a, a word of prayer to ask God's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will be with us this evening. You are our God, our Father through Jesus Christ. Tonight we will celebrate your promise of life, eternal vigor, eternal life as a gift that you've provided us through Jesus Christ as the prophet foresaw it. And so we pray that you'll be with us and receive our worship and sanctify it and cleanse it of everything that's faulty so that again it comes before your throne as the offering of grateful people. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The call to worship comes to us from, the, uh, from Psalm 148, where the psalmist said, Young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the, pray, the praise of all his saints, even saints today, the horn of salvation which he has provided in Jesus Christ. We praise him for that. The praise of all his saints, of Israel and the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. I love the Lord for he has heard my voice. He has heard my cry for mercy. From number 116 in the hymn books, let's sing those words together. Let's stand as we sing.
Psalm 146, said, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. Receive his greeting. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's turn and greet and welcome each other to this place and time of worship. You may be seated. Our focus tonight in our message is on Isaiah chapter 40. And uh, as a scripture reading ahead of time, I'd like to read the first 11 verses of Isaiah chapter 40. And then a little later on, before our message, we'll read verses 18 through uh, the end of the chapter, 18 through 31. So from Isaiah chapter 40, in my Bible here, it's found on page 669, if anyone wishes to follow. Isaiah is addressing the people of God who are about to go into exile soon. And yet he speaks words of comfort to them. Words that we find fulfilled in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 40, 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling... In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground will become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice and with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Thus far, we'll sing now the words... 149 in our hymn book, Comfort, Comfort, Now My People, based on these words from Isaiah chapter 40. Let's sing the three stanzas.
Let's now stand and profess our faith, and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed, summarizing the Word of God, that Word that is not to be broken, will not be broken, because His promises are sure. Let's say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's now sing the words of Break Now the Bread of Life, the four stanzas. seated. Isaiah chapter 40. We begin reading at verse 18 of Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> we'll focus mostly on the last couple of verses of this, this, this uh, chapter, 30 and 31. But before we read, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, this is your revelation to a weary, tired people in days gone by, a people that faced judgment, discipline because of their covenant breaking. But you made promises, rich promises. Help us to hear them, to find the true source of life and peace and vigor and soaring like eagles. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, 
Isaiah chapter 40, 18. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, the craftsman casts it. The goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He, selects, he looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the world was formed? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner have, do they take root in the ground than he blows them away and they wither and the whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? And who brings out the starry host one at, by one and calls, each one, calls them each by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my, my, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Though youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Thus far, the reading of the Word of God. May He bless it to our hearts. People of God, you, you remember from history, perhaps, perhaps you do, the story of Juan Ponce de Leon, born in 1490 in Spain, grew up to be an explorer. He was the fellow that discovered Florida. He was searching for an island called Bimini, which according to legend was the home of a fountain of youth a pool of water that was supposed to have in it restorative powers. Enough, perhaps, he hoped, to turn a 50-year-old 50 year Juan Ponce de Leon into a young man again. Well, in March 27, 17, or 1513, he landed on the east coast of Florida. He thought it was Bimini. He claimed it for Spain. But Ponce de Leon never found a fountain of youth. Instead, he was wounded in a battle with the native Floridians and died in 1521. Fountains of youth. Those are the things of which legends are made. Of, they, the stories are told about them. Some folks', some folks hope is based on finding such a fountain of youth. Because it seems to some that the, the healing, restorative powers of a, of a mineral spring, the, the powers that are supposed to be there, will restore their life, give them new vim and, vim and vigor. And so there are some older folks or pain-ridden folks from around the, the, the country are drawn to these places where there's supposedly a, a fountain of youth, hoping that they will find some restorative powers there. Of course, because we've never found a fountain of youth, we do many things to try to extend life. We do many things to make us feel young again, to try to recapture some youthful vim and vigor, to try to slow the aging process. We do lots of things, you know. We take pills, and we walk, and we trot, and we get facelifts, and we get tummy tucks, and we diet, and we get tans, and we go to fitness rooms, and we cut out eating junk food, and all intended to restore some, some longer life, some hope for longer life. But the fact is all these things are so temporary, they are so limited. And we 
often forget the words of Psalm 139, that all the days ordained for us are written in God's book before any of them came to be. As we all say, our days are numbered by God. So there is no really magic formula for finding a fountain of youth. All that we could do to prolong life somewhat bears a semblance to the idol that the man in Israel wanted to make. The idol had become his source of hope. The idol was supposed to provide some kind of magic powers to bring fertility to the field and to the house and to the barn. So he told the the woodcarver what he wanted. Some could afford to put gold chains or silver chains on that piece of wood. This poor man had a a block of wood that he had carved, maybe uh, spending more money on it than he could afford. But the ironic thing was that when they were all done with with carving this idol and putting the chains on, he had to tell the woodcarver, be sure to stake that thing down. I don't want it to fall on its face. Such is the capacity of any god, any idol, any cosmetic cream, any hobby, any exercise regiment, any plastic surgery, any flush bank account, any expensive toy to provide some kind of fountain of youth, some kind of lasting, enduring hope. The capacity of any of these things to restore youth, to renew our life is simply not existent. However, God has a fountain of youth. God is the fountain of youth. The mighty creator of heaven and earth provides for all who hope in him life, life, abundant life. For that we have a word from the Lord which was given to us through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. Now Isaiah was a prophet of God sent to by the covenant God to the people of, of Judah during the reign of four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. There was a time when the judgment of God against his rebellious, covenant-breaking people was approaching. There was a time when the yet unaware servant of God, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would arrive to discipline God's people by taking them into exile. As you read this chapter, you get a sense of God's people being a weary people, a tired people, a weariness that results from the emptiness of their idol worship. Their gods are as impotent as a carved log that needs to be staked down. Their gods give no hope. They make no promises. They fulfill no promises. And they demand as much as, much as these frightened people imagine. They demand even the, the sacrifice of their children. They're, they're, they are weary of kings who did not worship and fear God. They're, they are weary of the disciplines that came into their life because of their idolatry. A weariness. A modern equivalent might be, I suppose, a, a married couple who imagines that, that hope and, and happiness and status consists of, of, of having a house bigger than the neighbors and having all the toys that are available to them, but in the process they're up to their eyeballs in debt and they make only minimum payments. That has to be wearying, and for many people it is. For many folks, the idols that we have weary us. But Isaiah, in picturing Judah as a weary people, is also looking with them at their exile that is about to come. Soon they will be drugged from their homeland. Their houses and their cities will be brought down to ruin. Soon they would be taken and forced to live as slaves in a foreign land. Soon they would be surrounded by strange customs and strange languages and ruled by cruel dictators, a real cause for weariness and discouragement. But what is Isaiah sent to do? Before this exile even happens, and it will happen, he is sent to speak comfort to these people. He is sent to point out to them their God. The God they had been ignoring, the God who they were, they, they were replacing with their carved images that, that wouldn't stand by themselves. 
The basis for sending Isaiah to the people of God, this weary people, is found in, in God himself, the powerful covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. God speaking to a totally undeserved people and said, you want to know who is God? Do you really want to know who I am? Then listen. Tell them, Isaiah, he says, tell them that their hard service will soon be over and that their sins will be paid for. They will get back from me more than their sins deserve. Tell them, Isaiah, tell them that the valley will be raised up and the mountains will be leveled so that the glory of Lord of the Lord may be seen coming with mighty power into the lives of his people to deliver them. Tell them, Isaiah, tell them that I will again be their shepherd and they will be like lambs in my arms. Tell them, Isaiah, that I alone can do this. Why? Because I am so unlike these, these idols of wood that you nail down so that they won't fall on their face. Tell them, Isaiah, tell them that the same God who has the power to create the stars, who, 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 who gives them all a name, who calls them to their place, the everlasting God will do this for you. The contrast between that idol God that they've been worshiping and the, the, the um, almighty God who was speaking to them could not be greater. And it's this almighty covenant-making, covenant-keeping God who now promises to them a fountain of youth. Listen, weary people, says our text. You who wish that you still had the strength and endurance of a young man, you who envy his coordination and his reflexes and his speed, you who shake your head at the energy of a three or four or five-year-old, I have news for you. These young men and women, these children, they get tired too. They run out of stamina and energy. They fall down. But if you hope in me, if you hope in God, the mighty creator God who knows the names of all those stars, then these young men and women and these energetic children will have nothing over you. You want to know how your strength can be renewed? You want to know how you can have a renewal of life, real life? You want to know how to rise above the weariness of your pain, your guilt, your state of slavery in a strange land? Or you want to know how you can rise above the weariness of your battle with disease and, and aging, your weariness, your weariness of trying to keep up with your neighbor's materialism? Simply put your hope in God. Trust Him fully to keep His promises. Focus every ounce of your confidence in Him alone. Look to Him with that confidence that His Word is true and His Word is totally trustworthy. We read Isaiah today, but we add to his words, words from the New Testament, which tell us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust completely in his work for you, see the great creator God coming down in love to rescue a lost world and to bring his people back to himself. Then you will have found an eternal fountain of youth. First of all, he says, you will soar like eagles. You will soar on wings like eagles. An eagle is an amazing creature with its powerful wings. You know, it can fly among the clouds, it seems, from which it spots its prey down on the earth and begins that steep, powerful dive and halts just in time to sink its talons into the fleeing bunny or a, a shallow swimming walleye. I had a conversation a few years ago with a great-grandson who's now eight, but he was six at the time and thought he knew quite a bit at the time. And he said, you know, Grandpa, we were talking about eagles. He said, you know, Grandpa, he said, those eagles can be 40 miles up in the air and they can see a bunny down running on the ground. 40 miles, I said. Yep. And I couldn't dissuade him. That was the way it was. So I left it all. I left him believe that. But anyway, it's the invention of, of, of airplanes that uh, were inspired by people who watched eagles fly in the hopes that somehow they could imitate their freedom, to somehow they could imitate the eagles, the thrill of eagles flying through the air. And Isaiah says to these weary people of God, you want to soar on eagles' wings? 
Instead of putting your hope in carved blocks of wood that you need to stake down, instead of putting your trust in anything made of wood or, or fi uh, fiber or, or glass or steel or gold or silver, put your hope in God and He will renew your strength. He will provide for your ability to soar on eagle's wings. Put your confidence in Him. What Isaiah, for, I, for Judah, it meant that they had to trust their covenant God to deliver them and set them free. For us in the New Testament, it means trust completely in the finished work of salvation that Jesus Christ did for you. Then you will have strength to fly, the strength to soar. And what did he mean? How do we soar? How do we fly? People used to talk about getting high on Jesus, and they used this language as an alternative to some folks who were talking about getting high on meth or cocaine or something like that. We want to use the words, the language of the New Testament to imagine what it means to fly on eagle's wings. Paul writes that God raised us up with Christ and has seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He also wrote someplace, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your, heart not on things, uh, set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. John in Revelation pictures the 144,000 standing around the throne. Talk about soaring on eagle's wings. This is already true and will be true for those who trust in the Lord. What a fountain of youth for us who seem so earthbound, so subject to sin and disease and aging and dying, but who put our hope and trust in the Lord, you will soar on eagles' wings. Isaiah goes on to describe this fountain of youth. Those who hope in the Lord will run and not grow weary. Those of us who seldom run anymore envy the kids and the young folks that go running by on the bike path day after day. Sometimes all I'm walking, they fly by me, you know. I'm not going to do that anymore. But, you know, they, they too get tired. Those who hope in the Lord run without getting weary. What does he mean? Well, when we, we, when we do have to run sometimes, you know, it's with a, with a sense of urgency. We have to get somewhere quickly. We need to, to help out here. We, there's maybe a child or a grandchild who's running on the road. We have to get them back. Those who hope in the Lord will run with an eagerness, with an urgency to serve. Do not grow weary in well-doing, Paul wrote. He describes the shape of a life where trust in the Lord is real and genuine, and genuine hope in the Lord turns, turns us away from being self-centered, self-serving, idle, enamored people to people willing to serve, willing to give. There will be a sense of urgency to our calling to support the church and the kingdom and, and the, the, the mission of the church. It will be the hope in God that sustains us. It's that, that hope in God that drives us. Without sincere trust in the Lord and in His grace, we grow weary in a hurry. We turn inward. We live only for ourselves. But where hope in God is real, we serve with eagerness, eagerness and we continue to serve until we can no more. Finally, those in the hope, who hope in the Lord will walk and not faint. Actually, most of our life is walking, plodding one foot in front of the other. We walk from one day to the next from one day on the job to the next day on the job, from one meal to another, from one crying child to another crisis in the family, from one frustration to another, maybe from one temptation to another, from one day of pain to a better day and then back to where we were the day before, one worship opportunity to the next, one every Sunday is followed by Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. We attempt each day to take our children one step closer to responsible adulthood. Life for those hoping in God, for the most part, is a walk. But where hope in God is genuine, we will not grow faint, because we are already soaring on Engel's wings. Our citizenship is in heaven. And so we keep on plodding. We keep on meeting each day, each demand for our time and energy, each challenge with the confidence of one whose hope is in the Lord, who in Jesus Christ has already been made a new creation. 
one who is in Christ, has in, in Christ Jesus soared on eagles' wings to a new citizenship in heaven. May we continue to display that eagerness to run, to walk, without growing weary, because our hope is placed where it ought to be. So the secret of a soaring, running, walking is faith-filled hope in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Old Ponce de Leo never did find a fountain of youth, nor has any other explorer or health guru or fitness buff or lottery winner. Only our Creator, covenant God of grace in Jesus Christ provides real renewal, true regeneration, all-encompassing all comfort, the comfort of youth renewed like the eagles so that we already are soaring and we will continue to run and to walk without weariness in serving is our hope firmly placed where it ought to be in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this picture of people who soar on eagles' wings, who run, who walk without fainting. Help us to know where the secret is, where this fountain of youth is located. It's in you, in your gospel, in the word of truth that you have proclaimed to us and you have demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to rid our lives of all idols and to put our hope totally, completely in your work for us. Through the power of your Spirit at work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God. A, word, a song that comes out of the Reformation, but it describes where we find our hope in the Word of God. Let's sing those stanzas together. Let's stand as we sing 469.
be seated. Before prayer, we have a, some prayer requests that come to us from uh, Merlin and Bev Swart. Their three-year-old grandson, Darren Van Ruckel from Rock Valley, is in the hospital. He uh, with an, had an infected appendix removed on Friday, still in, hospital with, not in the hospital with nausea and pain. I want to remember that child. And also about uh, Heath Stoker, their son-in-law. He's having chemo, doing chemotherapy at the time. And also, uh, Bev's sister Nancy is starting chemotherapy for breast cancer. So they have quite a bit going in their family. We want to remember this, them. And I think I ought to mention also that uh, Joyce Heinen is uh, in Aspen Heights in Hull, but uh, her good knee, the one that she relies on, is very bad, bone on bone. And so there's some concern about whether she can... Uh, have anything, have anything done to that knee or whether she can stay there in this, in this place, and that's quite a concern for her, her because she likes it there and, uh, and uh, it's doing well there, but that problem is developing. So we want to remember her too and, and other folks. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are the life-giving God, and you give us hope, you give us peace, and Father, we pray that we may claim that, that blessing of yours, what you provide for us in a, in a culture that would turn us aside to other gods, to idols that do not satisfy, that make no promises, that fulfill no promises. And so, Father, keep us faithful as your people serving you. And help, we pray that our children and young people may grow up to trusting you too, to trusting your word, to trusting your truth in Jesus Christ, and also be able to uh, shed off the, the temptations to trust the idols of the culture in which we live. And so, Father, we pray for all our children and young people and young adults. We pray that they may finish this school year well. We pray, Father, that you will bless the, the college students, that they may uh, be able to, to take, care, take their exams with, with, uh, with quality results, and that the other Young people and children may also finish their, their classwork and, and be prepared for a summer, but also that they may leave this year with renewed knowledge and with renewed wisdom in who you are and how we must serve your kingdom. So bless them and their teachers as they finish. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us in the week ahead as uh, the, the week promises uh, some, some rain, but also as it promises uh, the kind of weather that allows us to get back in the field. And so, we, Father, we pray for the planting of seed and the working of the soil and, and that you will keep the farmers safe in the fields and on the roads. And we pray, Father, that this may be a good week of, uh, of working the soil, perhaps some planting, uh, and all that we do keep us in your care. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us in all the work that we have to do, whatever our tasks, whatever our responsibilities are, whatever offices we hold, Whatever duties are ours, help us to be faithful. In our work and in our tasks, help us to be people of integrity and honesty. Help us, Father, to be people who recognize you are God and we are your children. Here to serve, here to run, to walk, because we've already soared like e on eagles' wings into your, into your kingdom, into a citizenship that's not of this earth but of heaven. So, Father, bless our homes and our families and our marriages, parent and child relationships where there is some stress or strain. We pray, Father, for healing. We pray for your grace, your healing grace. And Father, remember the folks who, uh, who need you, who need your care. We uh, pray for Herm Brenneman. We pray that this uh, spot on his, his foot may heal so that he will not have to have his, his, his leg removed. We pray for healing for him. Pray for Al Meninga, too, who is uh, losing strength. And, and we pray, Father, for much grace in his life. And we thank you for his witness of a faithful service in so many ways. We pray for Joyce Heinen as she deals also with uh, the uh, discomfort, the, the pain of a, a knee that's gone bad. And we pray, Father, that you will watch over her and something may be done to help her and give her patience and grace. We pray, Father, also for the family members of Bev and Merlin Swart. We pray for that 
grandchild. We pray for healing. We pray that he may be able to recover and go home following that surgery. We pray for their son-in-law who's going through the chemo. We pray, Father, that you will use this to, uh, to heal his body, to re re remove the cancer from him. And we pray that for, as well for Bev's sister Nancy. We pray for her healing as well, that this cancer that may be eradicated with the treatment. And Father, we pray for all those, continue to pray for all the folks who were mentioned this morning by Elder Franken. We pray, thank you, Father, for, for remembering them and, we, and for, for bringing them before us. And we pray that you will answer the prayers of your people on their behalf as well. So, Father, we pray that you will bless the mission of your church, the spread of the gospel. We pray for the work of farmer to farmer, and we, we pray for the situation in Nicaragua that this work there may continue, even though there's a lot of turmoil in the country. We pray, Father, for healing and restoration and peace. Father, we thank you for some of the progress being made in the Korean Peninsula, for the possibility of do, denuclearization. And we pray that that hap may happen and that there may be peace in that part of the world and that some of the threats that were, were voiced may be stilled. Father, we pray for our own country, give wisdom to our president and our leaders, and we pray for people, men and women of Congress, may be willing to work together for the good of the country instead of each letting their ideology halt any kind of progress. We pray, Father, that you will bless our nation and we pray that there will be a reformation, a, a return to you, a recognition that we've gone too far in, the, in a wrong direction, forgetting you, forgetting your ways, forgetting your law, forgetting the gift of life that you give, forgetting the value of marriage. Father, we pray that you will, with your word and spirit, bring about a reformation and renewal in our country. May the gospel be powerful. So, Heavenly Father, Bring peace to your troubled world, especially the Middle East, we ask. Keep us in your care throughout this week. May it be a good week of work and education and training, a good week of recognition of your blessings, a good week of thankfulness, a good week where we recognize your care and your provisions for us. So, Father, hear our prayer, receive our worship, and bless the gifts that we give for the work of missions and evangelism. Multiply them as they are distributed to all the people who serve us in various parts of this world. May it provide for them and a continued support, but also a, a, an incentive recognizing that they, they work for the body of believers to spread this gospel, an incentive to continue to be faithful. So bless them and use them, we pray. Hear our prayer, forgive our sins. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering is for mission and evangelism, and the outreach. Let's present to God the gifts that we have brought.
let's stand and sing two verses of, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Those two stanzas, and then we'll receive the parting blessing that we'll sing stanza three. Let's stand as we sing. bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.